Bom dia, eu sou a Gabriela de Laurentes e é um prazer participar como mediadora do seminário História das Mulheres, Histórias Feministas. Ontem tivemos duas mesas com falas de mulheres incríveis e hoje não será diferente. Infelizmente, a Ju de Chicago não pôde comparecer, mas a mesa será muito legal do mesmo jeito. E para as perguntas, é, vai estar a Fernanda, a Ellen e a Shirley passando com os papéis e vocês podem passar as perguntas para elas, que a gente vai fazer ao final. A nossa primeira convidada é a Gabrielle Schor, diretora, fundadora da coleção Zamlung Verbund, em Viena, com foco na vanguarda feminista dos anos 70 e na percepção de espaços e lugares. Ela editou inúmeras monografias, como sobre Francesca Woodman, com Elizabeth Bronfen, em 2014, e sobre Renata Bertman, com Jessica Morgan, em 2016. Em 2015, Shore editou o livro Feminist Avant-Garde of the Seventies. Então, ela vai subir agora. Thank you very much, Gabriela. I would like to say thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, Lilia Schwarz, Adriano Petrosa, and thank you so much, um, André Mesquita. It's, a, it's great how you organize this, ex, this um, seminar, and also thanks to Majori. I'm very impressed about the diversity of this uh, seminar that you invited activists, curators, artists, ac uh, academics, and it's really, I mean, I'm very impressed, and I'm uh, it's a great pleasure for me to speak here. Now, before I speak about, uh, about why it is for me, why I think it's important to call the feminist art movement an avant-garde, I would like to give you some background information about the um, research I'm doing now for the last 13 years. So the Sammlung Verbund collection is a corporate collection and it was founded in 2004 in, in Vienna by Verbund. Verbund is a, uh, the biggest um, electricity company in Austria and we produce hydroelectricity. And, okay. Um, so the company's headquarters is located in an old baroque uh, place in, right in the center in, of Vienna. And alongside the facade of the headquarters, we have a nice installation of intervention by Olaf Eliasson. Actually, um, it's now 10 years on and every day when the sun goes down, yellow fog comes up for one hour. And the, it's very popular, the children, they want to catch the fog and people make photos in front of it. So um, whenever you come to Vienna, check it out. When the collection was founded uh, 13 years ago, I was able to, to make a good deal with the CEO of the Verbund. Um, so we arranged, um, they take care about, hmm? thank you. They take care about um, the energy, and I take care about the art. So this means they really do not interfere in my artistic decision, and this gave me a curatorial freedom, which of course I very much appreciate. So far the collection has two focus. One is um, about, you, Gabriella mentioned it, Uh, about the perception of spaces and places with many works of Fred Sandberg, Gordon Matter Clark, Anthony McCall, and many, many others, and also all of Eliasson's piece. It belongs also to this section. And the other part is about the feminist avant-garde. And we have um, uh, 40 works. Uh, oh, sorry. We Now we have um, now um, the the section of the feminist avant-garde holds holds um, works from the 70s by more than 50 female artists, and um, we yeah we 
I was able to, to make some um, publication, for example, the first publications from the Austrian artist Birgit Jürgensen and Renate Bertelmann. It's their first book uh, in English, so it's um, my aim also to bring uh, artists, um, uh, Austrian artists, uh, in, uh, international, um, in the international art field. And then um, we have, for example, 80 works by Francesca Woodman, and we did the first uh, publication, German publication. And with Cindy Sherman, I worked three years for her catalog resume of the very early works she did when she was a student in Buffalo. The works are not so well known, and um, she did all this work before the famous um, film stills. So in my presentation, I would like to point out how important it is to introduce new terms into art history, especially when it comes to art of women. Why? Let me tell you an experience I had. In the course of my research of feminist movement, I discovered uh, something surprising. In an old catalog of a group show, I found some works from the 1970s by a German artist, Renate Eisenecker. Okay. And I, I was fascinated by her work, and then I thought, oh, this, this work would be great for this part of the feminist avant-garde. So I tried to contact her, and then I realized, oh, she has no home page, she's not represented by a gallery, there, there is no publication of her work. However, I found her phone number and I called her. I asked her whether she still has her works from the 70s and the artist answered, mm, 40 years, nobody has asked for it. I will have to look in my attic. The day after, I called her again and she said, yes, everything is well wrapped. But are you sure that you're interested in my work? I was astonished that she was surprised about my interest. A week later, I visited her in her studio in Switzerland and we discussed her feminist work she created in the 70s and her prices. Her prices uh, were too low. I told, you, I told her um, you have to raise your prices because your photographs are vintage and unique pieces. So finally, we agreed on a higher amount and I was able to acquire some impressive photographs series from her for the collection. And on my way back to Vienna, I asked myself, so why are these great photographs worth almost nothing after 40 years? Why do artists like Renate Eisenegger have no self-confidence in their work? Why has her work been isolated for more than four decades? So I thought one of the reasons could be that feminist works from the 70s have little value because their work is not embedded within a specific art historian category. Since art history operates with specific terms such as constructivism, surrealism, or even the Viennese actionism, which are of course considered as avant-garde, also the feminist movement of the 70s should have an appropriate art historian term. So I wanted to create a term which indicates a pioneering position those women artists have. And I decided to call this movement the feminist avant-garde. So we are all familiar that the art of women has systematically excluded in art history. However, over the course of the last decades, the writing of art history has clearly changed, not, on, not at least because more and more women occupying important positions in the art world, in the museum and in the universities. A growing number of well-researched publications and major, and major exhibitions have undertaken a thorough review of history of art, of the feminist art movement. 
So to name only a few publication, so you see the co four covers, uh, one by uh, Connie Butler's uh, publication WAG and the Feminist Revolution, and then you, you have from 2015, it's our publication, and then by Catherine Morris, who gave his speak yesterday. <laughs> It's her book, We Wanted a Revolution, Black Radical Women from 65 to 85. And then um, Radical Women, Latin American Art, 1960 to 85 by Cecilia Foyado Hill and Andrea Junta. Um, an exhibition which comes also to Brazil, to Sao Paulo, at the Pinacoteca. Connie Butler's work show, which toured through the United States between 2007 and 2009 was indeed a milestone achievement and encouraged many curators and art historians to continue their research in this field. I remember well when I saw the work show in PS1 in New York City in 2007. For me, it was a kind of affirmation of my own research into feminist art. So what these uh, four publications have in common is they are historical studies of pioneering works by women artists. They make hidden works by women artists visible. They present women artists who had excluded from art history. And they provide a theoretical and critical framework that these artworks deserve. Um, it stands out that three publications emphasize in their titles Radical Women and Revolution. So the subtitle of Connie Butler's work show is Art and the Feminist Revolution. Catherine Morris's publication stresses on both term revolution as well as radical woman. And Cecilia Foyada Hill and Andrea Junta are using as well the term radical woman. No doubt that those titles are perfect exhibition titles, and no doubt that those titles meet the enormous achievement of women's artists. The title Radical Woman signals strength, being sovereign, and signals that women stand up for their rights. The term revolution signals a fundamental change in art and a revolt against current authorities that women artists undertook at that time. Again, both terms, radical woman and revolution, is appropriate to characterize the feminist art movement of the 1970s. However, revolution is a political and social term, while avant-garde is a specific art historical term. And from my point of view, it is important to emphasize that the feminist art movement was an avant-garde so that these artists will be included in the canon of art history. Uh, Renate Eisenegg, the artist I mentioned before, received in 72 when she made uh, this uh, series an award. In the early 70s, it was completely new that an artist staged a narrative series with herself and wanted these photographs to be accepted as art. So I think also the fact that she received an award proves that it's really a pioneering work. In the 70s and also before in the 60s, new media such as film, video, photography, and performance, performance gave especially women free hand um, to express their ideas in a very spontaneous way, and especially for the, photo, it, and especially for the photographs. Um, it, um, the women artists uh, could deliberate themselves from the old man-dominated tradition of painting. Now, what has the women artists of the feminist avant-garde in common? A central credo of the women's movement was the personal is political. 
New themes were discussed for the first time in public. Pregnancy, childbirth, motherhood, housewife, sexuality, partnership, beauty standards, rape, and the female body. Many artists took up these issues in their work. I would like now to share with you five topics. Okay, first. Um, artists reflected the one-dimensional role society gave to women at that time. So, uh, for example, the Austrian artist Birgit Jürgensen, she created an iron stuff and put it over her body and wearing it as an apron. With the bread in the stove, Jürgensen is alluding the saying to have a bun in the oven, which means to be pregnant. And the photo and, um, and Helen Chadwick in London constructed a kitchen object and she also is wearing it over her body. Many feminist artists reflected in her work the burdens of unpaid reproductive labor, which women do at home. In her drawing, Jürgensen stages a symbiosis between housewife and the table. Vali Export overlaps a traditional posture of Madonna from a Renaissance painting with everyday life situation of housewife. And Renate Eisenacker is ironing the floor of a whole wall. In her video, Leticia das Parente, I know I'm not pronouncing this name right, sorry. Um, in her video, um, she shows um, a black mat ironing ironing her white mistress, who is laying on the ironing board. It is the black woman with a lower social standing who makes the lady beautiful. The video spotlights the differences of class and race that separated women. And the Viennese artist Karin Mack Interpreted ironing as a completely practice, uh, ironing as a contemplative practice. Yet here she dresses in black as she were attending a funeral. With her whole body, she lies on the ironing board. She let her arms hang down, close her eyes, and declares the death of the housewife. Um, so. The comparison I'm showing you, um, it was a process. Um, it really took me some years to bring all this uh, comparison together. And um, I was so surprised also with Karin Mack. I mean, she lives in Vienna. And when I visited her, she had all her vintage photographs in her box, you know. Uh, and I was wondering why nobody came to her and and brought her work, I mean, to the art world. So, I mean, for me, it was an interesting experience, and it's, of course, always exciting to discover works and, and then uh, to bring it, to, to compare it and, and see how, how what, what these artists did in, at that time. <clears throat> Everyday routines of women's life, such as ironing or scrubbing the floor, was discussed within the artworks. Merely Laderman Ukles wrote a manifesto for maintains art in the 1969 and started to perform. Chris Rush performed um, at the famous Women House in Los Angeles. And when you look closer to the drawing of Birgit Jürgensen, you see the three women scrubbing the floor and you will discover the wash clothes they have in their hands turn out to be little men with whom the three women doing the cleaning. So for many women, ir irony was a suitable strategy to criticize the patriarchy. Now we come to the second part. 
Oh, there are some more. Several artists um, so looked up, so locked up in the act of breaking out. Several artists used the metaphor of the cage to express their sense of being locked up. So you see Birgit Jürgensen is transforming uh, the housewife in a lion and um, the Dutch artist Lydia Shorten um, shows a woman uh, who shows a woman uh, her own body who cannot escape from the cage in her performance. The artists wrap their faces and bodies in various kinds of cocons. Donna Hennes, Franz Francois Janico, Renate Eisenecke, and Annika Zolter. Uh, it's interesting to compare those uh, works by Annika Zolter and Renate Eisenegger. They are both uh, German artists, and um, Renate, um, Annika Zolter is um, taking the yarn over her face, uh, uh, yeah, over her um, face, and uh, is wrapping her her head. But on the end, when you see the la the last li line. She's taking a scissor and is, uh, and is cutting through uh, the yarns. And it's an act of liberation of herself. And um, whereas um, Renate Eisenegger, I asked her, um, first I asked her if she knew the work by Annegret, because they are both German artists, so they, they did not know about each other. And, um, and, uh, but for Renate Eisenecker, she said, oh, there is no liberation in my work. Um, there is, um, because the women's movement have far from one through. And I think I find it uh, quite interesting uh, that um, a similar aesthetic strategy or uh, um, Im images uh, can have different uh, yeah, statements. The British artist Ellen Shemrit photographed her naked body dried up from heat to toe. When I asked her about this work, she explained, I quote, the work was made in response to a series of lectures given by the head of the sculpture department at the Slade School of Art in London. In one of the lectures, he stated that a woman could not function as both an artist and a woman. My work was a sort of silent protest, end of the quote. The third topic is female sexuality, which is relevant. Uh, one of the main goals of the feminist avant-garde was the sexual liberation of women. Introduc to the introduction of the contraceptive bill in the mid-60s gave women more control over their fertility. Many feminist artists addresses this new freedom, but they also highlighted the oppression of female sexuality and the sexual objectification of women. So in her performance, the artist Olin, in her performance, the artist Kiss, she offers herself to the audience. For the fee of five francs, she sold a kiss to the visitors in 1976 at the, at, in Paris at the FIAC fair. And to express the objectification of women, the performance caused a scandal and the artist was fired from the teaching job at the academy. So in the little known photo collage by uh, Penny Slinger, um, she dresses in a wedding cake costume with her legs spread wide. In front of her vulva, she places a successive eye. So, and she titles her work, um, I See You, so which indicates that the vulva is not anymore a passive organ, but rather becoming an active organ that has power over the male viewer. Slinger quo, uh, explains uh, her work. She told me, I quote her, 
I, in this work, I confronted the old su subject-object dynamic and became the subject of my own sexual identity. In the 70s, frankly, there was not much understanding that women derived pleasure from sex. It was more seen as something women submitted to for the men in the sense of close your eyes and think of England. Quote end. When I visit Salter in her studio, it was just recently, uh, two weeks ago, I found this, uh, I found this work and I was very, uh, I mean, I was very uh, exp um, impressed to find it. And I was like, wow, she did a similar work then, I mean, she did, she expressed a similar idea in her work like Penny Slinger. So, now for this presentation, I could uh, compare it. It's great. And then you have also this idea about uh, voyeurism. So Alexis Hunter, who, who her, she, she did her work in London, and Katalin Ladek, she did her work in Hungary at that time. They didn't know each other either, but they, they expressed also the, a similar idea. And then Lydia Schatten in her film performance, um, she's uh, clear saying this statement, how does it feel to be a sex object? And it, this um, film is much more aggressive than the other work we have seen before. The fourth point is role play. Many female artists escaped from their one-dimensional role in society. So role play seemed to be the the appropriate tool to question cliches and stereotypes. I just discovered that the Austrian artist, uh, Renate Bertelmann, um, and um, the Brazilian artist Regine Fata staged similar transformation of their selves in the, in the 70s. And um, I am very proud. Ye yesterday, I had the opportunity to speak with Regina Fata, and I'm very proud that she gave the okay that we can acquire her work for the collection. So it's one more Brazilian artist. <laughs> so Cindy Sherman, as I mentioned before, she started um, her role play in the mid 70s in Buffalo when she was a student. And when we had our exhibition, the first one in 2010 in Roma at the Galleria Nazionale d'Arte Moderna, um, Martha Wilson, the Amer American artist, came to see our show. And she was so um, surprised to see the early works by Cindy Sherman. And although both artists in the mid 70s were in Buffalo, and, did be, uh, and, and Martha Wilson did performance in this. Um, um, artist space hall walls, but she couldn't. She had at that time she had not seen the work, and she 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 so she, she discovered that she did similar works like Cindy in the 70s through the exhibition. And what is also impressive that um, this uh, not so well known ar Italian artist Marcella Campagnano, she did it. She did also her, a role play in the, in, in the same time. So it's nice to connect them together and shows that, uh, and again, it's really the first time that so many women artists did that. So Susie Lake and then the Afro-American artist Lauren O'Grady, she did a, a very important um, performance now, the last point, five, the normativity of the beauty. An important topic in feminist art is the critic of the dictate of beauty pro propagated by the booming advertising industry of the post-war area. Women had expected to be pretty and need in all situations of life. So here you see artists like Eleanor Antin, Leticia Dasparente, Sanja Ivekovic, they all deal with this 
uh, reflect this idea of being beauty. Teresa Burger, who lives in Peru, for example, compares an average Peruvian woman's figure to the idealized measurement of a slender North American moniker. The differences between the imperialist importation of Western beauty ideals and the natural body makes psychological conflicts inevident. And Ellen Noentin um, undertakes a diet for 36 days and then she photographed her body from different perspective and the series confront the oppressive rigor of weight loss programs. Now, I would like to share now again some um, further comparison, only a few of them. So what is very striking about the feminist avant-garde movement is that many women artists took over similar strategies without knowing each other's work. So Kathleen Lade could not know the work by Anna Bentieta at that time because they were um, edited uh, posthum, as you can see, in 1997. Also, it's interesting, Martha Wilson and the uh, Austrian artist Frederick Bessold. Um, both artists choose a serial formal structure and frame the same physical detail in a diagramic arrangement. So I think also, ha as you can see, Hannah Wilke and Orlan did similar works in, in, in the mid 70s. And um, I think the writing of art history still needs more emphasis um, of formal analysis when it comes to, to women art, because there is so much subject matter in this work, of course. We, maybe it, that's the reason why there was not yet so much under, I mean, there was not so much uh, formal uh, analysis. And I think um, we could now start also with this. So Francesca Woodman, Birgit Jürgensen, and again Renate Bertelmann. It's impossible that, well, these two Austrian artists, Birgit Jürgensen and Renate Bertelmann, maybe, but they could not know Francesca Woodman's work because also her work were posthum exhibited in, in 1986, uh, a show Rosalind Krauss and um, Abigail Solomon Godot did. To make a conclusion, I would like to read the definition of the term avant-garde. I quote, the avant-garde are artists or works that are experimental, radical, or unorthodox with respect to art, culture, and society. The avant-garde art is non-traditional, aesthetic innovative, and initial unacceptable. The avant-garde also promotes radical social reforms. Quote end. I believe that, all, that the feminist avant-garde embodies all these aspects. The art critic Lawrence Alloway declared in 1976, I quote him, the women's movement in art can be considered as an avant-garde because its members are unit by the a desire to change the existing social forms of art world. Quote end. However, Ellaworth's observation that the feminist art movement of the 70s had all the makings of an avant-garde has unfortunately largely gone unheeded. It seems to exist a kind of blind spot in the art history. I would like to give you three examples. So the German um, prestigious um, dictionary of avant-garde holds uh, 220 uh, articles. And the word feminism is not listed. So it, the feminist art movement is not listed. The dictionary of the avant-garde, um, it's a second edition with 700 pages and uh, it appeared in 2000 the visual art section, do not list the term feminism art. 
So, um, and if you look up under avant-garde, um, uh, Wikipedia, you find all the avant-gardes we know. Um, yeah, surrealism, pop art, and even the four artists of the Viennese actionism considered as avant-garde in art history. But you don't find the feminist movement of so, what units these women artists? For the first time in history of art, the feminist avant-garde artists created a new iconography, a new image of women from a feminist perspective. The feminist avant-garde clearly indicates a pioneering position in postmodern art. The artists succeeded in a fundamental succeeded in a fundamental re-evaluation of social and aesthetic values. It is time that the feminist avant-garde artists are registered in the canon of art history. They really deserve it. Thank you. Obrigada, Gabriele. Bom, a nossa segunda convidada é a Marina Wischmidt, que é escritora e editora. Ela também é professora de indústria cultural da Goldsmith University of London e diretora de um seminário de teoria na Dutch Art Institute. Seu trabalho foi publicado em várias revistas como Ephemera, After All, Journal of Cultural Economy, Australian Feminist Studies, Radical Philosophy e várias outras. Ela é autora, com Kerstin Stackmeier, do livro Reproduction, Autonomy, Work, Money, Crisis and Contemporary Art, e atualmente finaliza a monografia Speculation as a Mode of Production. Hello. Um, so, yeah, just to start out by thanking, thanking MASP for inviting me to this absolutely mind-blowing event. I was really impressed with half the day, the second half that I saw yesterday. Um, and also, uh, so thank you, Andre, Marjorie, and all the others who made this possible. And thank you, Gabrielle, for your, for your talk. We're gonna be overlapping a little bit, I think, particularly in the artists we're talking about. So the presentation will be on social reproduction and the negativity of women's work, as depicted in some particular feminist aesthetic gestures, which will draw on my current research on Letizia Parente, Margaret Rospe, and Linda Benglis's 1970s moving image works, as well as several contemporary works that take up reproduction in the more symbolic and institutional sense. Here, I'll be developing the speculative category of reproductive realism, which has two sides, an affirmative side that glorifies gendered labor and a side that is sardonic, excessive, or absurd, which I'm addressing through some specific concepts of negativity and materiality imminent to the work, but also to Marxist feminist and gender abolitionist discourses particularly relevant vis-a-vis -vis current far-right anti-gender militancy. So I'll discuss a sample of historical and contemporary art practices, as I already noted, through the lens of social reproduction. So this will be in two senses. In terms of an established feminist notion of reproductive labor as a spectrum of gendered tasks, or in the sense in which social reproduction can be taken as the reproduction of the conditions of production, as in Louis Althusser's analysis. In the second instance, the perpetuation of capitalist society and the individuals in it makes reproduction continuous with social production. Some of the work I'll be looking at performs the impasses of a kind of social non-reproduction, which belongs to the second type, with the social reproduction perspective assuming the function of institutional or perhaps infrastructural critique. Through these two ways of looking at reproduction, 
I aim to trace a politics of subjectivity, reflecting the double dynamic of strategic affirmation and refusal of identity, endemic to all movements of the oppressed. In these strategic affirmations and refusals, art does not behave simply as a representing institution, but as an iterative one. As a reproductive institution in its own right, art becomes a site of inventive and self-determined forms of work, while also traversed by class relations and thus class struggle, and not just class. Throughout, I will contend that the separation of reproductive labor as a political matrix from its position in the reproduction of capital is a risk for the feminist politics of social reproduction. This tendency can generate um, ambiguous effects, such as the moralization of care work and the self-evidence of the need to manage crisis, coupled with a de facto confirmation of gender roles none of which diverge in any radical way from capitalism's own strategies for propping up its profit rates on the exploitation and deprivation of those least able to resist. Instead, it is to the negativity, waste, and uselessness of reproductive labor that we might turn in order to see the vulnerability of the social whole in relation to this gendered work, which is both abjected and moralized. So specific feminist art practices materialize this by emptying out the so-called, so to speak, value of reproductive labor, highlighting the affective features of the kind of conceptual uh, conjuncture that I'm talking about here. So the concept of social reproduction in feminist theory, I'll start by breaking that down, giving a bit of a history of that. The concept of social reproduction in feminist theory and feminist movements emerged in the 1970s, especially in Marxist and socialist feminism, coinciding roughly with the generalization of a range of critiques of orthodox Marxism and highlighting the shortcomings of its analysis of labor and the blind spots in its conceptions of struggle. Conceptualizing feminist theory and struggle through the framework of social reproduction has recently been thought to allow for a more unifying approach which takes on intersectionality while sidestepping the critiques aimed at older models of Marxist feminism, including the problems of the dual systems, so patriarchy on one side, capitalism on the other, debate from the 70s and 80s, and some of its narrower assumptions, which can tend to be predicated on a model of gender relations that universalize the situation of white middle-class women. Thus, more recent Marxist feminist analysis tend to include not just unpaid, but paid reproductive labor outside the home, such as healthcare, care work, sex work, which Leopoldina Fortunati was already looking at in the 70s, and so on. And they've also been expanded to consider sexuality and race, bringing into visibility the technologies of racialization and illegalization that prop up accumulation through the economic and social devalorization of the labor of many, if not most, of the global population. So during the 70s and early 80s, Marxist feminists emphasized the centrality of reproduction, arguing either that reproduction produced value or else that it constituted the very conditions of possibility for the production of value. But the concept of social reproduction can often be stretched designating not the, not the reproduction of a mode of production, but the reproduction of life per se, through which the capital relation is reproduced, but contingently, not centrally. It's more about the reproduction of life. And as such, it becomes difficult to explain how to separate the categories of life and capital in any determinate sense. So usually when Marxist feminists speak of social reproduction, they can mean something quite specific. The production and reproduction of the special commodity of labor power. Special because it adds more value in the production process than it costs. Yet what falls within the remit of the reproduction of labor power is itself still open to specification. 
So this is then what makes it difficult to conceptually distinguish the reproduction of labor power from the reproduction of life as such, particularly when what has been called wageless life and other writers have called surplus population, that is surplus to capital's um, employment, the redundant, the precarious, the expelled, becomes an experience increasingly central to the configuration of global societies. But what if we put reproduction on a continuum of capitalist productive relations and not in a separate sphere, whether it's mediated by the market or not? Marx discusses reproduction in the chapter on simple reproduction in the first volume of Capital in these terms. He writes, whatever the social form of the production process, it has to be continuous. It must periodically repeat the same phases. A society can no more cease to produce than it can to consume. When viewed, therefore, as a connected whole, and in the constant flux of its incessant renewal, every social process of production is at the same time a process of reproduction. So goes on to say, capitalist production, therefore, under its aspect of a continuous connected process, of a process of reproduction, produces not only commodities, not only surplus value, but it also produces and reproduces the capitalist, and here we can also say the gender relation, the race relation, the capitalist on the one side and on the other side the wage labor, so that the class relation. This makes a distinction, end of quote, this makes a distinction between social production and social reproduction hard to maintain at that level of the social whole, that level of abstraction. Um, so some strands of social reproduction feminism uh, have, have advanced uh, the need for a unitary theory, and so they, they see the category of social reproduction as answering this need for a unified analysis, which also necessitates a reckoning with the non-economic or extra-economic uh, factors that feminism as we already heard, personal is political, has addressed consistently as a, as a perspective and as a movement. So moving to art, reproductive labor in the Marxist feminist narrative is a category designed to recast as labor activities performed in private and coded as natural. which enable the activities that go on in public and are coded as cultural or productive. So this is done as a means to move the private into the public and to politicize the enforcement of the distinction between them as an ongoing uh, constant of gendered and racialized exploitation. The key question becomes how to situate reproduction in its gendered and racialized and colonial specificity without drawing from it an affirmative politics that valorizes the subject of reproduction and her activities, which neglects the dialectic between the reproduction of life and the reproduction of capital in favor of a kind of more autonomizing idea, as if life and capital can go their separate ways, also unmediated by state violence and its mechanisms, both of consensus and coercion, as we heard a lot about yesterday. Or, as I will discuss a little bit later, without engaging in what I call reproductive realism, which can initially be defined as a market imminent valorization of radical identity, devoid of any critique of the conditions which both reproduce those identities and the forms of structural violence that are administered through identities in the cultural sphere. So both in the autonomizing and this more cynical option, both tend to be um, open to the problematics of moralism. And there's a tendency to bracket or exclude political and collective questions. 
leaving aside the dilemmas of antagonism, composition, and subjectivation. So while there's more complex political debates and genealogies than I can mention here, the key issue is how to extricate the politics of reproduction from the renaturalizings that have developed in the wake of its denaturalization as labor by Marxist and social feminists in, in recent and socialist feminists, sorry, in recent times and in current times. So I will now turn to how such a project of denaturalization of reproduction, of gendered labor, as well as of gender per se is pursued by a sample of historical as well as current and historically inflected art practices whose take on reproduction indexes a paradigm shift in the focal points of feminist critique from the housewife in the 70s to the dispersal of this focus amongst the infrastructures and systems that determine the collective life chances for populations. So the more kind of um, explicitly by a political turn. And art's capacity to render these legible and transformable. So given what I've just been saying about the issues with social reproduction feminism, can we look to art for models of anti-reproductive labor and gender practices? So the motivation to ask this question comes from a number of places. Initially, it's because art itself can be seen as a reproductive institution in Althusserian terms, an institution not directly implicated in the reproduction of capital, but which contributes to socializing that reproduction when capital is seen through the lens of the reproduction of relations, social relationships, like class, race, gender, and other systems of subordination. And the way it does this primarily is by seeming to stand beyond them or above them, like education or religion or the state itself, Therefore, ideologically, pointing to a space of autonomy from the consequences of those relations of power. So this relationship becomes more direct, especially when modes of labor relations and subjectivity rooted in art become the economic norm, as in the figure of the creative entrepreneur that gets imposed upon the indebted and self-investing or self-exploiting subjects of unending crisis. Gender and gendered labor, likewise, can signify a way out of that or a form of um, unconditional, unconditional care, love, affect, or nature, or even a kind of psychosocial excess, which stands in a complicated relation to economic, structural um, imperatives and discourses. So this opens up a number of questions, for example, for inquiries such as by the journal and collective endnotes into what they call the logic of gender, which positions gender as a psychic libidinal residue that outlives its ideological as well as economic utility, but still uh, sticks to the skin, as they say, kind of abject form. So the relationship between production and reproduction has been a core issue for feminist art practices in recent decades and in the present, though with, very, with few exceptions, it hasn't consistently been the focus of feminist art history. The depiction of working women or women's work in and out of the market constitutes a strong strand in the image politics of feminist art and film and moving image. Yet there's also another, perhaps more um, oblique strand where the artist identifies with being a worker, but it's not clear whether their work is productive, reproductive, or just unproductive. In this mode, art's relation to work may at first appear as just mimesis or irony. So we can loosely periodize two overlapping phases of such gestures in the art of the 20th century, and uh, specifically this touches on Gabrielle's point of what gets um, included in the avant-garde. So there's a heroic phase, often male, so we can think of constructivism here, Rodchenko in his production suit, or appeals to industrial work, even if it's ironic, made by people in the 60s and 70s, like Robert Morris or Edward Keenholz, Richard Serra, Andy Warhol, in which artists seek to identify with the worker as, the, as a kind of central agent, agent of history, uh, if, if they're on the left, or as a, as a kind of... Um, 
stereotype if, if they're not, or maybe both. And an anti-heroic phase, taking hold in a period in which work and its logic had subsequently become generalized for all genders, where artists appropriate the gestures of work to make subaltern forms of labor present and disruptive to the categories and institutions of art and labor. So here, the example of Eucheles is, we have the same image as Gabriel. Uh, the example of Eucheles uh, often comes up in this debate, washing the steps of the Wadsworth Athenaeum or Francis Elise later on. Uh, holding a pl placard, renting himself as a turista amidst the other day laborers in Mexico City's Ocalo Square, or Pilvi Takala, Finnish artist, turning up to work as a marketing intern to conspicuously do nothing all day. In a continuum with this relation to work in its de-heroicizing phase, are practices that emphasize lethargy, failure, entropy, boredom. Of course, like the period of Soviet productivism also had its counter tendencies as with Malevich, like um, emphasis on futility, laziness, um, not doing. Yet here I'm mainly interested in more specific questions of how art practices have allegorized the entropic qualities of reproductive labor in particular, as we saw with the Renetta Eisenegger ironing the hallway piece. So I have that's kind of what I'm looking at, those kinds of um, gestures. Denaturalizing reproductive labor by making it look foolish, futile, or indeed epically absurd. These kinds of portrayals denaturalize reproductive labor from both sides, i.e. from the side of labor and the side of art. They cut away its social embeddedness, showing it purely as an activity which can be de- and recontextualized while they highlight the social relationship within which this activity can either lose or acquire an aura of inevitability and necessity with all the moral implications that necessity carries. So entropy seems like the main modality through which we experience an alienation from the manifest or unarguable usefulness of reproductive labor. So the idea of entropy is already expressed in a, a woman's work is never done kind of phrase, and so on. And indeed, it can be offered that all uh, so-called socially necessary labor, wherever it's performed, whether it's waged or not waged, shares this quality of entropy as a hallmark of the experience of alienation, of alienated labor. And that's why I'm choosing to focus on reproductive labor for that reason, because it's much clearer there. Uh, nonetheless, I'm going to start off by regarding practices that take the more Althusserian or Foucauldian, since the biopolitical is never far away, stance of using the field of art to stake out embodied, affective, and formal critiques of reproductive institutions, such as prisons, racialized urban decline, and the infrastructural violence of physical and mental normativity. We can examine the practices of Park MacArthur, Cameron Rowland, Latoya Ruby Fraser, or Eva Kotetkova from this perspective. In MacArthur and Rowland's work in particular, there's a coextensive dimension. Now, I'm not going to speak closely about the work. Um, there's a coextensive dimension of imminent critique of the art institution, yet one which both absorbs and inverts the already canonized lessons of institutional critique. It is the contingency and the overdetermination of the art institution and not its omnipresent power that we're shown. When wheelchair access ramps are harvested from nearby facilities and reappear as works in the gallery in MacArthur's ramps from 2010 to 2014, or when rented uh, prisoner-made desks are put up for rent rather than for sale, evoking the system of convict leasing in Cameron Rowland's exhibitions. So here, stigmatized identity is articulated as a formal principle. The means used, however, turn back on the mechanism of representation itself, insofar as representation can lend 
of phantom tangibility and fullness to that which in terms that are explored in contemporary theory with, with categories like Afro-pessimism or gender abolition can exist as a site of nothing, of nihilism, of a kind of social death within a system of social relations and the, and the significations or subject position possible within it for the racialized. Thus, on the one hand, there's an evocation of biopolitics both within and beyond the institution of art, while on the other, there is a refusal to depict its subject in the available terms of aesthetic critique or polemic to short circuit the enunciative claims that such practices risk reproducing and thus legitimating for the platforms and consumers of such critique. Here, a reproductive focus implicates the art institution as a paradoxical state apparatus, which both normalizes and defunctionalizes in Claire Fontaine's terms, allowing other potentials to emerge as material hypotheses. However, like all institutions whose economic significance is displaced or is relatively indirect, art can also act to legitimize existing social arrangements by providing a space of indeterminacy and experimentation. The question of what traction the defunctionalization of subjectivities and objectivities can have, just like who does the work, cannot be uh, put off for long. There is thus a way in which the first sense I've been using of reproduction in, in this presentation aligns with the already cited legacy of institutional critique as a problematic for artistic practices, an implication uh, that, that cannot be fully explored here. So going back in time and shifting category, the second reproduction, which, or rather the first in my discussion, which connotes reproductive labor, presents a more clear-cut strand in feminist art histories, although the practices I will discuss are traversed by concerns both with gendered labor and institutional dynamics. So the 70s saw a number of feminist art strategies which operated to denaturalize both art and work from the standpoint of gender politics, emptying feminized domestic tasks of natural content to fill them with social content in a way that also interrogated the normative, aesthetic, and institutional claims of art. So as already mentioned by Gabrielle in 69, UKLA's Maintenance Art Manifesto and Practices, like this one, uh, here it's interesting, she's washing, washing the pavement outside the feminist uh, art gallery, artists in residence. Um, dragged housework into the space of art, which is now a canonical feminist gesture of recasting certain kinds of feminized life activity as work, upending the sovereign uh, status of the artistic work in the process while exposing the gendered, also colonial, as we'll see, content of the separate spheres idea, which both ensured the fragile autonomy of art and drained it of political force. So like wages for housework movement, for example, Ukeli sought to bring value to the excluded, here the excluded of the institution of art in its broadest sense, and there of wage labor and wages for housework, the excluded was um, women's work from wage labor and the labor movement. In both cases, this valorization is at the same time a devaluing, that is a strategy which also challenges the institution that orders visibility and invisibility, exclusion and inclusion, as well as the larger systems that it represents and legitimates. So Ukeli's also introduced housework and, and paid cleaning labor outside the home as she does in other projects such as I Make Maintenance Art One Hour Every Day in 1976 or the most famously Touch Sanitation, 77 to 80, to the repertoire of feminist art in some senses also as a comic medium. While in terms of the second uh, type of reproduction I talked about, the reproduction of the relations of production, art's reproductive role in society also gets highlighted thereby, and its sovereign status is exposed to its own abjection by associating it with those other activities. So the kind of comic horror of reproduction is most famously perhaps taken up in Martha Rosler's Semiotics of the Kitchen, but perhaps less well known 
is Margaret Raspe's camera helmet films, also made in the early 70s. So mounting a Super 8 camera on the hard hat, Raspe documented domestic tasks, mainly food preparation and washing up, at the same time as she was doing them, mixing the icon and the index in the key of domestic labor. Unlike Ukeli's flushing domestic activities to the public surface of the grammar of art, or Rosler's mutinous anti-demonstration video, Raspe seems to tie her comedy act to structuralist film and industrial film with the kind of nebulous brutalities of surrealism, so the title of the film, The Sadist Beats the Unquestionably Innocent, which is about egg beating, belying the work's debt to industrial sociology's time motion studies, echoing the her contemporary uh, German artist Charlotte Poznanski's shift from collaborating with industrial workers on producing minimalist sculptures as her art to leaving the art world for the sake of more political uh, traction as an industrial sociologist. So there is a kind of feminist realism here, but it's one of transvaluing domestic materials and industrial materials with all their associations with reproduction as a routine, as a regulation of the ever same into the willful and contingent apparatus of art. Unpicking the separation of spheres formally, but also performatively, she engaged the body-based aesthetics of feminist performance to estrange these prosaic activities by turning them into structuralist film. At the same time, the camera helmet played on the affectation of industrial working class masculinity, so in vogue at the time among male artists such as Richard Serra and Carl Andre. Apart from the collapse of action and documentation and the displacement of humdrum women's activity into artistic action, there was also the idea of a woman as a domestic appliance, or as Raspe called it, the Frau Tomat, where the discourse of reproduction veers into the technological, which is something that gets echoed a lot now with discussion of robots. So this crossover between gendered labor, reproduction, and ingestion in her work can be picked out in recent works such as Wengechi Mutu's The End of Eating Everything, uh, where a fantasy creature performs the technologized reproduction of abjected black feminized post-human life we see waste as a creative force, as a medium that propagates the destruction of representation. Finally, from this era, we can mention the short performance films of the late Letizia Parente, such as In and Tarefa One, which we already saw, which dwell on the fungibility between the gendered body and housework, between self and furniture, subject and object. Parente hangs herself up in wardrobes, lays herself on an ironing board to be ironed by her maid. Parente's location in the Brazilian post-colonial context means that any dramatization of gendered labor cannot help but disclose the racialized and classed others in the home, where much North American and Western European feminist art showcased the isolated housewife. She turns herself into an assisted ready-made, again in clear allusion to histories of surrealism, the chance meeting of an umbrella and a sewing machine on an ironing board, but assisted by what we in the North America call the help. So that's what a, a domestic, domestic, paid domestic uh, workers get called the help. The registers of realism here are several, from the feminist realism of the household as a prison and a site of mystical rituals, to the realism of racialized class relations contained and naturalized by the household. The performative actions, as signaled by the sewing of the words made in Brazil into the bottom of her foot in 1975's Marca Registrada, also evoke not just the pacification of the traditional bourgeois housewife, but the counterinsurgency against subjectivity and agency experienced by those living in a dictatorship, solicited to identify their interests with the body of the nation. And the subject of this film is shown proactively incorporating the nation into her docile body, just as in the same year she incorporated gender by drawing a lipstick mouth of her own, uh, sorry. Oh, I don't have that one, sorry. Uh, over her own silenced, taped over lips and eyes in Preparatia One, but you saw the image in Gabrielle's presentation. The body is an artifact of institutions of violence and control, the biopolitical side of social reproduction, as an aesthetic practice, crosses over with reproductive labor as reproductive of gender and the gender relation in Parente's work. 
Across these practices of staging, inversion, and displacement, we also track the importance of the gesture of negation, which at times happens via rather a spectacular gesture, a disorienting or discomforting over-identification with the sensual success that gets associated with any variant of the feminine, whether it was écriture féminin in French psychoanalytic feminism of the 70s and 80s, or the core imagery that was beloved of the more esoteric feminist artworks of the 1970s. This is the mode adopted by Linda Benglis's Female Sensibility from 1973. This film, which is from a series of three videotapes the artist produced in the mid-70s, grew out of her involvement in the feminist movement and were influenced by feminist film theory of the male gaze. Benglis takes on here the then dominant ideologies of the artistic subject adopted by artists of both genders, the sovereign artistic subject, and a video as a truthful activist medium in order to construct an extremely stylized, sensual and sarcastic mise-en-scene of the possibility or rather impossibility of female representation in the image. If there could be such a thing as a specifically female sensibility as some feminists claimed, could it ever be actualized without slipping into the conservative principles of the subject or the medium? Here, the erotic performance Benglis puts on with her co-performer, with an everyday, if to us extreme sounding variant of sexism playing in the background with a talk radio, makes for a strange slippage between a male fantasy and a female fantasy, normative and queer, in the spectacle of erotic contact between two androgynous performers, one of which is Benglis. Unlike a lot of feminist performance art at the time, it was not portraying trauma or troping awkward humor or aggression. It is actually quite unreadable. The eroticized representation of women gives both a lot more and a lot less than is expected. There is a violence that gets acted out through the self-containment and insularity of these figures, their utter self-possession. There's a frustration of any political reading in this work that doesn't include irony and the kind of weird or missing affect in the way we can understand militancy. It's neither sexy nor angry. It's like a 19, 1980s pop video gone terribly wrong, 10 years before the era. So is it even possible to analyze this directly or indirectly in terms of the set of concepts around social reproduction that I've been developing so far? So maybe the conclusion will take us a bit further in this direction. So although the presentation was titled Reproductive Realism, I haven't really quite discussed it except for a few sentences yet, so the conclusion will be that discussion. So over the last few years in my research into how theories of social reproduction can generate new political insights that link the work of second wave feminist artists to others from that period who may not have identified as such, as well as to contemporary work, I also started to develop some still rather unsystematic thoughts on what I've been calling reproductive realism. With this category, I would like to think about contemporary art practices, which are market affirmative, sometimes reflex market reflexive as well, but not always, and yet call upon the legacies of Marxist feminism, autonomous Marxism, queer and trans theory and politics to propose a theory of the subject and the collective as always already uh, subsumed that is incorporated or co-opted into a flat horizontal plane, perhaps modeled on social media networks, of something called the production or the capture of value through identity. It's a kind of market realism or capitalist realism with the vocabulary, with the, uh, with the vocabulary added of social reproduction feminism, but one which really does understand reproduction practically as the reproduction of what is of what exists, and with only perhaps a representational or discursive relation to alterity or negativity towards the status quo. What interests me about this approach is the performative gesture it makes towards the futility of critique and the importance of reproduction, of life, of sociality, of queer kinship, with critique presented as abstract and destructive and the, and the reproduction as a politics of survival, which are truly adequate to the current moment of all pervasive capitalist crisis, whether that crisis is understood as a crisis of social reproduction or as a crisis of valorization that drives capital to try and capture ever more raw material from subjectivity and sociality. 
While many examples could be brought to bear here, my own thinking along these lines began with my initially collaborative relation to a scene of queer and feminist uh, post-internet art exhibition and discourse whose main protagonists went in a direction of non-ironic mimicry of art market functionality with the assumption that critique is for the privileged. There's a cultural logic which is quite pervasive and one which splits the social field in two. Those without privilege whose eyes are fixed only on the immediate and the privileged who can afford to dream as we see in this, or, and criticize, as we see in this quote from a recent film review of the new US film, The Florida Project. So she writes about the character, the working class child character. Though Mooney and her friends do express slivers of their hopes and dreams, they keep their eyes down toward the grass, whereas children from wealthier backgrounds may look to the sky, end quote. The implication seems to be the excluded, can do, the excluded can do all the working, but the rich are doing all the dreaming, and our everyday nightmares are their dreams, and that's just how it is. There's a striking measure, I think, of kind of, I think, uh, well, this is arguable, but I see it as a kind of class contempt in such formulations, a total dismissal of any agency which is other than reproductive. In this notion that a radical questioning or radical encounter with the way things are means making the best of them and no more. So I realize this has gone a bit off track from the art historical trajectory, but the point was really to break down the idea of reproductive realism throughout this paper as an alienating but also an affirmative force, and that realism can carry lots of different political uh, contents depending on the context. After all, the real is about as heavy an ideological device as can be imagined. So these episodes uh, from a reproductive history of entropy, negativity, compel us to think not just about housework, even if women still do the majority of it, but the whole apparatus of gender those practices can throw into question. It's the apparatus as reproductive and reparative of the gender relation that gets denaturalized when gendered labor is depicted as something monstrous, abject, but also prosaic and eccentric and the domestic is a kind of weird or paradoxical space, bereft of nature or nurture or hope. And certainly some of the images in the first category um, Gabrielle showed also uh, contribute towards this transvaluation. So in this kind of strange, although obviously not unprecedented in every sense, period of uh, right-wing uh, cultural and social backlash that is happening here, well, all across the world, uh, and that includes institutions of art and academia here. Much of that raises outrage around the idea of gender and genderism as a kind of alien imposition from planet perversion. So I'd like to end my talk on this note, citing, mentioning if not digging into the discussions on the queer and materialist feminist left around the abolition of gender as one important touchstone for any feminist politics, including in the field of art history nowadays. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Vamos para começar agora as perguntas. E a primeira pergunta vai para as duas em relação as diferenças de abordagem metodológica e teórica, a escolha por usar o termo vanguarda e, e adotar uma perspectiva marxista para analisar até artistas em comum que vocês fizeram. Então, a, a pergunta é, vocês consideram quais são as, as semelhanças e os distanciamentos que existem entre as abordagens, as perspectivas teóricas de vocês? Um, well, the first thing, as I can say, which might already be obvious, is I'm not an art historian. Uh, so this this work that I'm that I've been looking at is has formed a part of my research over a long period, because I'm involved in kind of research into feminist art, mostly as a writer, as a critic, but I'm kind of not not trained in particular art historical or curatorial paradigms, really. So that's why the work kind of maybe functions to materialize some theoretical ideas and maybe stretch them further or turn them upside down. Uh, and that's kind of why I'm 
using them in a kind of, or kind of pointing to them rather than using them, which sounds quite exploitative, is the short answer. Maybe I'll just start with that. Um, well, my method, um, it was actually to, mainly um, I made a lot of research for in old catalogs from the 70s and found um, a lot of, of works there. And then, yeah, contact the, the, the artists and, and find out if the work is still available. And uh, this was mainly uh, the research. And I think um, I, I just wanted to, to mention to the, to the talk from Deborah ye yesterday, because she said uh, there is no uh, term for, or no name or word for a mother who, who lost a son or the parents who lost their children. And I think this idea of uh, creating new terms, I think especially when it comes uh, to women, um, yeah, art or experience, um, it's very important. And I, I would like to encourage her. I'm sure she will find a name and then it's in the world. Então, aproveitando, eu vou continuar com a Gabriele, é, essa escolha de usar o termo vanguarda ao invés de radical, por exemplo, é, é, um, é uma opção que veio da onde? Da, por que você escolheu esse termo vanguarda feminista? Né? E, e se isso poderia ser compreendido como uma espécie de anacronismo, ou se essas artistas já se consideravam vanguarda naquele momento, e se é possível pensar uma vanguarda hoje? Well, we always rewrite art history, hmm? and um, I think the term avant-garde, I think it's important because um, um, to, that this movement um, has a pl place in the in the canon, and the the avant-garde is uh, from the history. It's very uh, main dominated. And um, I think there is no reason why this movement should be excluded from this uh, canon. And it's simply one, one strategy more uh, to have, to have recognized, to, that this work is recognized and this movement is more recognized. I mean, I showed also the other publication and the, and the exhibitions, and this is the same, um, it's the same effort what these uh, curators do, that this movement is more um, visible, and also that the artists and the works are visible. Uh, Marina, uh, can you talk a little bit about how the movements feminist movements, the collective art of the United discutem a questão do precariado hoje e se discutem né? e como. Um, I mean, I guess also in terms like maybe the feminization of labor, which becomes synonymous with with precarizing of labor, do because um, traditionally women have had more precarious working conditions, lower pay, uh, more exposure to sexual violence. So this is all kind of also coming out a lot. Um, as has already been mentioned with kind of current discussions around kind of me, me Too, as well as the kind of more organized specific uh, feminist art or activist collectives. And I guess, as I kind of mentioned at the beginning, intersectionality as probably as here is very important. So what also tends to happen in the kind of activist space, again, maybe also here, I'm not sure, there can be a bit of a generational debate between kind of um, a certain sort of portion of kind of second wave or kind of older generation of feminists who insist perhaps on a women's identity as the basis of political subjectivation um, and those who are more kind of working on non-binary and trans um, kind of perspectives and um, existence as the bedrock of gender politics. But um, I mean, I guess in terms also of, of more specifically of labor, um, I mean, certainly in my experience right now, there's 
a lot of overlap between the two strikes that are going on in my workplace in the next few, few weeks, which is a strike by all the lecturers about pensions and the, and the women's strike on the 8th. So there's a lot of organizing to try and bring those, those issues together. And also kind of the discussion around reproduction is also becoming very much a kind of category of the analysis of, of the workplace, that all kind of labor has this reproductive aspect to it. So some of the organizers of the women's strike, like um, Tithi Bhattacharya is always arguing this, or Chinsia Ruza as well. Um, e na sua abordagem, né, você considera que então essa relação entre uma perspectiva marxista é, da, da arte seria a, é, a arte seria nessa perspectiva só um reflexo de uma teoria ou ela é, ajuda a constituir essa teoria? Uh, I would say definitely the latter. Yeah, uh, it helps to constitute theory because it's itself theory, it's, the, it's self theoretical practice, it's a material practice of thought and speculation. And to the extent that it's kind of embodying or pointing towards a kind of de defunctionalized practice, social practices, it, it has a kind of dimension of futurity or emancipation to it already, which is why it can also model these forms of negativity in a, in a way that maybe can echo with other areas of political and theoretical, theoretical practice. That's why I'm interested in them, anyway. Yeah. É, Gabriele, no seu trabalho você apresentou uma série de, de semelhanças entre trabalhos de mulheres que nunca se conheceram. Você acha que... É, por que você considera que elas nunca tiveram esse contato, que elas tiveram uma espécie de isolamento? E por que tanta semelhança entre pessoas que não se conheciam? Quer dizer, circula alguma coisa culturalmente? Há um imaginário compartilhado, coletivo, que faz com que elas se expressem de formas que se aproximam? Actually, um, I had a longer talk, and but because I wanted really to meet this uh, half hour, and there is, it's not really through. Um, They, that they were, they were not really isolated. I mean, they were really, actually, they were organizing a lot. For example, Vali Expert did in Vienna a very important exhibition called Magna Feminismus and Art and uh, Creativity to, to underline the, the, that women um, are, have the power of creativity. And, um, And this was a very international show already, and 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 then and there were many many symposiums. The the, the women uh, created um, journals, um, magazines. There was a, a many things going on, and they were, on the one hand, they were isolated, but on the other hand, they were not. It's it's interesting because when you, I don't know, even in, in once in the small city of Vienna. You find works from the 70s, and the artists didn't know about each other. Although there were, there was really a movement, and you know, you know, you showed the, I, the this uh, gallery. It was founded by women, so because they had no possibility to exhibit their work. For example, Renate Eis, um, Bertelmann, she told me once she wanted to to have a show in a in a, and she asked the gallery owner if she could have a show if she could show her work there. And he said to her, to her, why should I show your work? You're married anyway. <laughs> so this was the situation for a woman artist at that time. I mean, and of course they organized themselves. They, 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 um, and um, so it's interesting. They were not isolated, but they were isolated. They organized themselves, but also they didn't know too much about themselves. So, um, and on the end, what was the question? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there was two, maybe. Oh, yeah, and why uh, Avan or no? Because uh, it's pioneering, yeah. Porque, it, 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 porque as obras se assemelhavam? Uh, porque... Ah, yeah, why the work? Ah, this is, um, this is easy to say. I think it's because they all had a similar issue, these women artists. I mean, they didn't really want to get 
they wanted to be accepted as artists. They, they had this issue about the one-dimensional role society gave them, uh, not only to be mother, housewife, and they wanted to break out. I mean, and there are many works um, I haven't shown about against, against the violence, or, uh, of violence against women, about the rape. There are um, many, many issues those women had in common at that time, and that's why they discuss it in their work. And it doesn't matter if they are in Europe or in, in Brazil or in, 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 in the States. Aproveitando o que você falou, tem uma pergunta para as duas, que seria, o feminismo é uma categoria que funciona, é, que funcionaria apenas para pensar a sociedade capitalista? Ou dentro, que seria um debate dentro da sociedade capitalista ou não? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, also because there's all these kinds of histories coming out of feminist practices in the Eastern Bloc. I mean, you can. there's also arguments about whether those were also kinds of capitalist societies, but I mean, let's just say they, were, they weren't capitalist societies. Or, I mean, I guess, yeah, on the one hand, it depends like how you think, what constitutes a capitalist society and what constitutes gender. And certainly a lot of feminist practices, also like Sonia Vekovic, for example, as one very famous one. Oh, sorry, I'm pointing to it as if it was there, but it's not. Um, it was there a couple of hours ago. Um, yeah, in the sense that you can say there's a kind of modernity which constitutes an understanding of gender or an understanding of a strict male-female binary, then that operates in societies that were um, capitalist or liberal democracies or social democracies and, and that identified as other kinds of societies because the kind of reproduction of gender roles operated differently, but basically it still operated. So, yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of, a lot of kind of analysis and excavation of those histories in kind of non-Western kind of feminist uh, debates and art practices and histories. <laughs> Uh, when I talk to the artist, um, I realize, I mean, uh, the, these uh, artists um, I feel quite comfortable with this term feminism from the, from the work of the 70s. But nevertheless, many of them think they are not only feminist uh, artists, of course. So in, in this work, they express feminist ideas. But um, I think it's, um, of course, their art is um, wider. And, uh, but for, for those art, I think it's appropriate to use this term. Bom, acho que a gente pode encerrar. E muito obrigada pela presença de todos. Gabriele, Marina. Thank you. <laughs>